Welcome back this morning. It's still the Arise. It's still the morning show on Arise News, and I'm Biola Labi. And I'm Victoria Peppel. Now, Paul Owanibe is an African business magnate best known as the MD CEO of Landmark Group, an African focused real estate and service office company having over 500 companies as clients with offices in, on five continents. He was among the private sector delegates that attended the just concluded firm China Africa Corporation Summit and is here to share with us his takeaway from the summit. What Nigerian businesses must do to tap into the opportunities presented by collaborating with their Chinese counterparts and how they can remain competitive. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So there's been a lot, I'm going to jump in because there's been a lot of chatter on Twitter about the China-Africa the China -Africa cooperation trip. There were some of the, some of it started with people seeing President Buhari coming off the plane and he was being welcomed by a Nigerian delegate. So there were some memes on, the, on Twitter about that, like why are the same people that traveled with him welcoming him? So that's, I mean, but that's just uh, tongue in cheek. But I think one of the biggest debates that people have been having on Twitter, the going back and forth is the role of China, the increasing role of China in Africa, but also the increasing role of China in the world. And there is nothing that shows China's might than this big, I mean, in Africa than this big, China Africa Corporation Conference. What is, I mean, this isn't your first time there. No, it's what not. has been, what was your experience and what did you take away? Well, it was very different. I've been to China quite a few times and I suppose this was, this is only the second time in Beijing though. Um, but it was obvious that Beijing was set up for Africa um, on this trip. Um, so one of the things I noticed was it was actually a pleasure to be black in, uh, in yeah. Beijing that, yeah. that, that week um, because the city was brought to a standstill. They literally stopped the Chinese from moving around, they closed wow. the offices, and then it was really set up for Africa. All the hotels were full, all the African delegates, I think there were 52 African presidents, presidents there. And then, yes, it, it was exciting. Mm. At one end of the spectrum, people say um, there's a potential that Africa is selling out. At the other end of the spe spectrum, the more positive end is, is that we finally have a chance to align with a nation that's fast growing and that's um, where we want to be. Yeah. And as someone that was there, mm. how did you feel? Did you feel like you were going to be walking away with some new partnerships and new deals and you felt like the 52 African leaders were walking away with new deals? Or did you get a sense that there's probably it's something, there's something left somewhere in the middle? Well, always in the middle because I'm a businessman. Um, so I have my own views about how, how a, a country should set itself up and how a country should trade and how you can create sort of commercial activity. Um, and they're not always consistent with the views of, of many governments. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I sort of come more or less from the West where I say governments should step aside, let the private sector do the work. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is not about the government stepping aside. This is about the government knee deep and working with, um, working with the private sector from a top down perspective to try to make the economy grow. Mm -hmm. How many private sector delegates were on this trip from Nigeria? Gosh, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you that because okay. they're all over the place. But I, I would say officially may, maybe, maybe 10 to 15 companies. Unofficially, there were thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that there was a coordinated agenda and strategy going into China? <sighs> leading um, up to this? Well, I think that's, that's a question for a government official. But from, from a private perspective, um, um, it it's, wasn't as coordinated as I would have liked, but, but then again, um, that's, maybe that's my fault. Maybe I didn't prepare well enough before going. All right, so what was um, the trade balance or the trade be between Africa and Nigeria and China last year stood at $17 billion or $14 billion. And now this year, um, China is offering $60 billion to Africa. Now, a lot of people are very skeptical about mm -hmm. this. They've, they've said things like, you know, nobody can be so generous. And then there are stories they're making um, the, the, the news about the fact that it, when these deals are too good, um, if they're not used properly, the utilizing countries cannot benefit and then they begin to owe China a lot more than money. From the interactions you had and from the offers that were made, from the deals that were signed, I mean, these are low interest rates, lower than what the other developed countries have been giving Africa over time and what all the financial institutions also give Nigeria. So it seems like it's too good to be through, true. Are you on that path as well? No, I mean, I, I do say all the time that um, all that glitters is not gold. But at the same time, some things that do glitter are gold. Mm. Um, so you've got to be able to separate them. Um, 
So I have my concerns, um, like everybody else, but I also have um, what are those my, concerns? my positivities. What are those concerns? So I'll start from the positive okay. and, um, and, then, and then delve into the concerns. And the big positive is, um, for those who have been to China, um, can understand how a country can be built. And if you've been to China or any of the other sort of emerging mm -hmm. Southeast Asian countries that where government actually controls a lot of things and develops. I mean, Beijing is immaculate. It's probably one of the cleanest cities I've been to, probably one of the most developed cities I've been to, and probably one of the most hospita hospitable cities I've been to. So that, those three things say a lot. Um, and if they can do it for themselves, then maybe um, there is a chance that if we worked with them, we can do the same things in Africa. Um, and specifically in Nigeria. What do you think they want back in return? Well, I'm sure you, you've, you've read um, and you, you've watched the news about sort of the, the what's, what's it called, the belt in the road? Yes, <laughs> yes, like yes, 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 yes. Um, and there's a lot of skepticism as whether well, they want some political yes. control or. I'm, I'm not sure. I, think, I don't think the Chinese are like that. I think the Chinese. Um, want to expand their business. I think they're after the commodities. Yes. So you think it's okay, they are, but they're after commodities. Yes, so it's a commodity can, grab. Yeah. You haven't said your concerns. So, so, I don't my, want so my, my, to my concerns are, so Africa, Africa's future rests, the big risks for Africa rests on a few things. Yes, One is political stability across mm -hmm. the region and individually in, in some of the key countries. Um, two, two is fiscal slippage to ensure that, you know, fiscal policy doesn't slip too much. Mm -hmm. um, three is, is commodity collapse. If, if commodities actually do collapse, then you've got to ask whether China will still be interested in being, being in, in here. Um, four is the continuation of the reform agenda. I think everybody would, would agree that um, Africa today is not Africa 20 years ago. I think leadership is better. It may not be what we all want, but it's, it's better than it was. It's cleaner, it's more transparent, it's more active, um, and it maybe looks at the people a little bit more than just the, the government. Um, so what are my real concerns? My concerns are how do we stay on course, make sure that you know, investor sentiment doesn't sort of erode? How do we make sure that politically um, politicians or leaders are not too strong and a lot of that responsibility is devolved to the private sector? So I, I do believe that you know, if you devolve more responsibility, my, my fix for Africa is devolve more responsibility to the private sector. Um, the government should provide more of an enabling atmosphere. Mm. Um, Bilateral deals like this side with China should involve the private sector a lot more. The biggest concern is that if you borrow $60 billion or whatever individual countries are going to borrow, and you put it, you plow it into non-performing, non-income generating, generating assets, assets, then at some point our great-grandchildren are going to have to pay this back. Yeah. Well, the biggest challenge also is there's a lot, I mean, with other loans, there's also oversight and much more transparency required, but with China loans, the government is at its own will to do what it wants. True, but I don't think this is money. This is actually not money. Mm -hmm. It's not the real cash. The Chinese government are not Of course, it's, the yeah, they're not. Yes. But um, one of the things that's been happening, I mean, also once again about is Zambia. Zambia mm -hmm. has been a case now of, say, look at Chinese engagement in Zambia. I mean, I've been to China. I've also been to Zambia. And when I was in Zambia, literally people were pointing to me. The Chinese built this building. Chinese built this road. Chinese built this building. Now they're saying that some of the loans that Zambia has have not been paid back. And the, China, the Chinese are actually looking at taking over some of those assets. So there is, I mean, there is a lot of mismatch. There's a there's a huge risk there with some of these loans and some of these engagements that China will will engage much more in Africa. Do you when while you were there, did you feel that China, China the Chinese really want to sort of have that much presence in Africa, like own assets and sort of? Well, if you know the Chinese, they don't mind living anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and the issue here, really, and this is this is probably my second biggest concern. Um, so the, on the positive, the Chinese, when they get into a country, they actually get in knee deep. Mm. They, they, don't, they don't sort of skirm around mm. the edges like, like many of the Western countries. Um, but the biggest concern is you've got to ask yourself how much in the value chain do they actually add, how much they leave behind when they're leaving, mm. yes? Um, because is, is, are they developing or are they, are they working with countries to stay in that country and grow in that country? Are they working with countries to take it sort of back? back to, to China. Now, traditionally, and we work with the Chinese, and when I say we, we as a company landmark, um, but traditionally, the Chinese bring in everything that they, they, they put they in, use. They, they use. Mm -hmm. They even bring in their labor, mm -hmm. um, and, and they move them around, and they, they work hard. Um, so how much will we get the skills transfer? Will we create employment? Will we, will we produce technology that's appropriate for, for mm -hmm. our part of the world? Why are these and, things looked into in the deals that were signed? I mean, they could bring in their people for a period of time, transfer the knowledge, and then move back. Weren't these issues that were looked at when these deals were signed? 
I would hope so. I was not privy to... No, to, I mean, I think this to, has actually been a, yeah. a big complaint about China around the world. And actually, um, Zam one of the Zambians were always up in arms about mm. the fact that a lot of the Chinese infrastructure built in Zambia wasn't creating no jobs. It wasn't actually no creating no jobs, jobs at all. Mm. So yeah. that's a big problem. Yes, no, the value, the value chain is a huge problem. The other thing that, that's a problem is, is the quality of what the Chinese do. Um, so in some instances, and I'm not one of those that knock the Chinese because we work with them, and I've seen the quality of what they've done in the West, and I've seen some of the quality they've done in, in some parts of Africa. But if you go to China, it's a real testament mm. to what they can actually mm. do. Mm. Um, but but um, traditionally, there's been that thought that when they come to Africa, they don't give us the same level of quality. They give us an African quality. You've worked with them. Is that true? Um, it is true if you don't demand it. So you do have, and you, you've alluded to that, you do have to sit down get through your, your contract negotiations, ensure that what you are getting is what you want and not necessarily what they think you want. Um, so that's very important. So when you, you are negotiating these deals, you do have to pay attention to the skills transfer, the things that they're bringing in, the longevity of that. There must be a lot of transparency um, and authenticity. And um, I think those two words are, are words that, you know, if I were adv advising the government, I would say transparency, authenticity are the two things you need to watch mm -hmm, out for. Mm -hmm. and make sure whatever you're getting is authentic, make sure it's transparent, and make sure that there's a real value add and there's a leave behind. Mm. If you look at, if you assess a relationship with the Chinese government and the deals we've struck in the past three years with President uh, Muhammadu Buhari being the president of Nigeria, would you say we've gotten a fair deal? Would you say the relationship has blossomed and can we take it several steps further? I couldn't speak to the intricacies of any deal that's been signed between, directly between the government and China, but what I can do is give you my perceptions. Yeah. Um, and from a perception point of view, I think, I think the Chinese have, have made some have, have added some value to some extent. So some of the infrastructure that they have built, they, they can build very fast, mm -hmm. yes, um, they, so they can produce fast. So whether it's the railways and whether it's the airport or, or a few roads. And the issue now is how long do these things last? And we haven't gotten there yet. Sure, um, sure. And, and how much of the skills transfer has taken place? I, I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So I, I will say I'm not sure that there are many the many Nigerians that have been ordinary Nigerians that have benefited from that skills transfer. Direct benefits. Direct benefits. So it hasn't increased employment, it hasn't made a lot of people sort of more technical able and able to do this. Um, if they build the airport, are we going to will will they be maintaining the airport or will there be a a set of Nigerians that will be employed to, to maintain the airport. Mm. Um, you said something here which is sort of the um, authenticity and actually transparency. a transparency, which is also a rigor that has to go into these negotiations. Yes. Yes. I mean, you were there, you saw leaders from 52 countries. Did you, did you get the sense that we are applying or we're ready to apply, even let's say in the past maybe we haven't applied the same rigor. With the knowledge we have now, with the experience we've had now, we've seen some of the, we've learned from some of the things that have happened in Zambia. Do we think that African um, leadership and African citizens are ready to put in that type of rigor that needs to be put in, in when negotiating with China? Um, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Okay. So I'm, cautious, yes. I'm cautiously, cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Um, well, I, I said this on the show once, I'm pessimistically optimistic. Mm -hmm. and then, so, so yes in that um, African leadership is, is definitely better than it was before. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and there's some very smart people in government just walking around the corridors in, 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 in Beijing. Um, there's some extremely smart people that have some great ideas and are skeptical. And skepticism is important mm -hmm. when you're negotiating. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just believe mm -hmm. everything you see. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so those people exist. Um, but there's another layer. So it's not literally just the people. There's just a layer of the government itself and, and what, the actual, what the government actually wants from this and how they transfer that into the nation, which is why I said at the very big, at the top of the show that it's very important to transfer, a lot, devolve a lot of responsibility for development of the private mm -hmm. sector because the private sector are only there to make money. They're not there for flags in the ground. Um, you know, um, so it's very important that... So they, they put that rigor in and look to see whether whatever deals are signed, mm. benefit, well, come down literally to, to the Naira and Cobble mm. and, and benefit their own um, community. You know, I think we'll get there. I think, you know, we've got to see how these MOUs evolve. Mm -hmm. You know, I've mm -hmm. always said mm -hmm. signing something mm -hmm. and executing something are two different things. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and then also drawing down on the loan is also a whole nother thing. It's, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, whole no, it's a whole new ball game. Um, yes, you know, ideas without execution are hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> yes. you know, I want to shift a little bit from China. Let's shift him from China and let him talk a little bit about landmark and the landmark 
real estate investments you've been doing and some of the work you've been doing, especially along the Atlantic, uh, Lagos Atlantic coast. Mm -hmm. So Landlock is a company, so we look at ourselves as a, as a destination institu institutional developer. And what I mean by that is, what we, dis what we set out to do from day one was to create a platform where the commercial, the leisure, the entertainment, and the residential communities can sort of meet, interact, live, work, and play. Mm. Um, so that's sort of one-stop shop um, set up. And the reason, the reasoning for that is obvious, is that in, in a nation like ours and in cities like ours that are fast growing, there are many issues traffic, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, crime, mm -hmm. um, convenience. Mm -hmm. so, so we thought if you create a destination platform, then you, you combine that convenience, you shield people from sort of the crime and you shield people from the traffic and they're not that exposed and you can be more efficient with your time and, and you can get a better quality of sort of existence if you like. So that business leisure lifestyle meeting is what basically Landmark is all about. Uh, yeah. How accepting have Nigerians been to this? It's a slow burn. Mm -hmm. um, it's a slow burn, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that look, we get 60,000 people a week um, that come to sort of the, our, our landmark destination. And last and year, and which one is that? Which one? The, the one on the, la the one yeah, the just landmark. Spoke about. But that's the that's the main hall. So that's the it, which one of them gets 60,000? So the, the whole so, so the, the, whole the, the, the complex. Okay, yes, the, the complex. complex. And it's still in development. We're, okay. we're probably 20% through with this. Um, so there's still another 80% um, to do. So right now there's some entertainment. There's some the, the office. There's offices and there's a conference center, mm -hmm. um, and we've got a few um, sporting facilities there. So there's 6,000 people a week. Last year there were 3 million visitors. Um, Euro Money gave us an award for the mm -hmm. most visited destination in, in, really? in Lagos as well. Um, so, but it's, it's, work in, it's, it's, work, it's work in progress. We still have to create our hotel offering. I mean, it, you know, we have a boutique hotel, but we're, we signed a deal with the Marriott Group to do a 250 bed hotel. Oh. We still have to create our residential offering, so we're in the throes of developing our Waterview apartment block. And um, there's another office block coming up, and there's a retail boulevard coming, so you can live, work, play, and shop. In the recent numbers released by the Nigerian um, Bureau of Statistics, the, one of the areas that we actually saw grow was um, entertainment. There was actually growth in entertainment, but it, it was recreation and entertainment. Yes. There was some growth there. Yes. With the economy and actually with everyone sort of saying they're poorer than they were before, were you guys a little surprised to see that, or are you surprised to actually see conversions on ground? Well, I, no, I wasn't surprised, and, and I've always said this is is one of the one of the issues because of the lack of a sort of mortgage system. So people don't really have. Um long-term money in the country mm. um, and the, the financial institutions don't give long-term money so as a result people don't have properties that they own that they can leverage on and buy expensive things so a lot of money is spent on the things that are cheap mm. and entertainment in in this country is fairly cheap so mm. if you have nothing to do and um, then you, you 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 entertain yourself and there are different ways of entertaining yourself so a lot of a lot of our disposable income here is spent on entertainment and um, simply because you know you you couldn't just go out and buy an apartment or buy a car or invest in a business because you don't have that financial support to do that. Mm. Uh, there was a massive downturn in the economy that must have affected business. But now things are getting better. Um, I'm are sure. They? <laughs> I know. I'm they, right. uh, every, every recession <laughs> has been, the, the numbers have dropped for inflation, so things are getting better. So the, the question now is um, of course, plans have to be rearranged, things have to be done differently. What are the changes you're making to keep up with the economic change? Well, responsibility, financial responsibility, I think is important. Um, Debt is a, is a real killer in this country because it's expensive. So one of the things that any organization, any person should do is just be more, be responsible with, with how much debt you take on. And, you know, I, th I think there's an old saying my mom used to say, cut your code according to yourself. <laughs> yeah, so, I think everyone's mom said yeah, that. Yeah, yes. So, so, um, so that, that's one. The, the, the second is, you know, something that is coming into Africa or into Nigeria, um, more recently, which is just that whole Olympic mindset, mm -hmm. that whole pursuit for excellence, the pursuit for integrity, the pursuit for hard work. So if you can combine those th three things, excellence, integrity, hard work, um, in everything you do and all the people that, that work with you, then you begin to get somewhere in terms of mm -hmm. provi providing a service that many people want. Um, one of the problems we've had in the past is is we, we try to get away with what we can. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we don't have quality and excellence as a benchmark in the things we do. And I think the more we do that, the more successful um, we will be. So we're, it's work in progress. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. You said debt was, you said something about debt just now, about mm -hmm. debt being expensive, mm -hmm. but you also said you had um, Chinese 
um, partners. Yes. Are they investors? Have you worked? I mean, what is you been no, your what have, okay? What have been your outlook on um, foreign investors? Have you guys had a lot of foreign investors engaging with you? So, you so or has we, it all been local money? No, no, it's a lot of it's foreign money. Most <laughs> of it's foreign money actually, but but there is a lot of local money, and and we have had the local banks, so we've been supported by two local banks quite significantly. Um, we, we've tried to take it on a short-term basis and use the foreign banks um, to deal with it long-term. Obviously, we had a few major issues um, when, when the currency devalued um, because we had huge dollar exposures um, with, um, a, a, um, with legislation that was introduced mm. to stop repayments. Yeah. Yes, Excellent. to stop foreign um, Receipts. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. So we, we, oh, okay. yeah, we that were, yes, you as well. oh, big time. We were, we were stopped from charging our tenants in U.S. dollars. Mm. Meanwhile, we had U.S. dollar exposures, mm -hmm. and um, the central bank were not kind enough to um, allow us give to, you a waiver. <laughs> no, no waivers for you. Yeah, no waivers for us, and no, no foreign exchange for us. We were literally buying um, off buying, the street. Yes, we were buying U.S. dollars when it got to 450, 480, Ouch. literally just to meet our. Uh, our U.S. dollar obligation. So, so that that always is, is it, that was an issue, um, but it taught us something. And and sometimes I say I'd rather be poor than rich. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes when you are poorer and when when you have less cash flow, it gives you a little bit more responsibility. Um, so you you tend to build slowly and you tend to build in a way that's more sustainable. Um, so we've learned some of our lessons and and um, so we, we did that. What we did is we approached a few of our clients and we said, look, uh, we will give some discounts and we will reduce this to a naira rent, but you know, give us some longevity in your payments. And we used okay. that to okay. to pay down a lot of our debts, okay. if, um, almost all our debts. Um, and um, yeah, so the show so goes on. So, you, so you're also What's doing some that? hedging now. We're doing some, <laughs> you know, we're doing some our personal hedging. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. So looking at the future. Um, what are the long-term plans? Because you're adding value to the economy, you're adding value to Nigeria. What are the long-term plans? You still have a lot of projects ongoing. What is the big picture? Share it with us. So we call ourselves Landmark Africa. So we want to create destinations in multiple cities. Mm. Um, we, we've traditionally worked in, in 14 different African countries oh, wow. with our service office business. We had offices in nine of them um, in, and in, in quite a few different cities. So, you, so we have experience in East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, and South Africa. Um, we sold our serviced office business two, three years ago to, to the global leader, um, Regis. Okay. And then we decided to focus on our property advisory and property development business. And so, so that's what we would like to replicate. And we'd like to replicate that service office footprint with our property development business. So we're, we're seeking to acquire land holdings in some of these other African countries. Any so, other cities in Nigeria that you're looking at? We are looking at other cities in Nigeria. The we, major we, cities first, if you allow me guess. Sorry? The major cities first. No, no, no we're not guess. like that. You, I, <laughs> we're not like that. I think, look, a country with 180 million people, of which I understand the median age is 19, I mean, one of the things is that we have a young population, so that demographic dividend is there. And what does that mean? That basically means that there are people everywhere. And if you put the right platform and the right products in place, then people access them. And as those people um, get more disposable income and, and tend to, uh, you know, and, and basically grow up, then, then you, it will work. So we are looking at cities like um, Oweri, Benin, Really? Um, yes, we're, we're not necessarily... We're Does the economy of the city matter the location? Like you look at how well the city is doing economically before you go set up. Is that um, not necessarily, a criteria? Not, not necessarily. It is a criteria. I think it's important that the city I mean, has you have to, to be able to do long-term projections. You have to, yes, 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 yes. But I, I would say, you know, I'm a big believer in the demographic dividend, yes? Um, and, and history has taught us that, that countries, cities, Areas that have had young populations that are fast growing have always done well. But it's also a risk. Especially, as, well, you're especially in entertainment. Entertainment is really for disposable income. Yes, but people have to live somewhere. Yes. They have to eat somewhere. Yeah. They have to. They have to go to school somewhere. They have to go to hospital somewhere. So, so for being a real estate business and we're providing the envelope for all these activities, then, then where there are a lot of people, then there's a lot of demand, mm. and that supply demand dynamics um, works. Mm. Yes. Some of the work you're doing is around advisory. So if you think about the advisory work you're doing, one, um, Lagos has, um, Nigeria has to get out of being sort of a three-city country. Absolutely. And when you look at tier two cities and tier three cities, what are some of the opportunities you see there for a business like yours, especially in that tier three cities? Do, we, do you think we're going to have a significant number of those in the next 20 years? Is it 50 years? When is that going to happen? like so, other places in the world. So, so a lot of it rests, unfortunately, you know, whilst I'm a big believer in, in private sector mm -hmm. taking the lead, mm -hmm. a lot of it rests on the governance in these cities. And so we got to go back to the government. We have to go back to the China deals and see what type of infrastructures <laughs> we're building. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes and no. I mean, we also have 
have to you also have to create a platform mm -hmm. that's enabling. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I once said probably ten years ago to to um, to build a building in say Lagos State, you would spend ten to fifteen percent of the money mm -hmm. before you lay a brick mm -hmm. in the ground. Mm -hmm. The government didn't really have a pro proper enabling system for the private sector. That's changed, or let's say it's changing. It's changing. It's changing. So, so the, the governments are a little bit more enabling, but some governments obviously already are where they want to be, right? Um, when you go to the B cities, the category two and category three cities, and those governments are a lot more receptive. They're, you know, you can influence consumer preferences there. You can influence the way the government operates. You can you can get land at a better at better and cheaper costs. So you can provide better services that don't actually exist because people have concentrated on you know Port Harcourt, Lagos, mm -hmm. Abuja. Um, I mean, we are in Lagos, and because Lagos, you can't you necessarily can't avoid it. And and the big risk Lagos has is cities around Lagos getting better. Mm -hmm. um, and if they do get better, um, then then Lagos itself would need to would need to up its game to, mm -hmm. to, to a large extent um, so it becomes more convenient and, mm -hmm. and more attractive right now the biggest attraction of Lagos is just that there are a lot of people and a commercial commercial possible, activity. Yes. Yes. all right um, so you talked about the fact that you set up in other African countries as yes. well so tell us the difference between operating in this Afri other African countries and operating in Nigeria Huge difference. <laughs> Huge difference. So the obvious, the obvious difference is um, the obvious difference is of sort of language and economic yeah. activity. But, but I suppose the biggest difference, um, and I, I, I used to say when we used to walk around, drive around, or go around other, other African countries, the biggest difference was just the energy. The energy levels. Um, we some, we often don't know what we have in Nigeria. Mm. I mean, we have a, a resilient population, mm -hmm. a young population, what fast growing. What about government policies? So, the government policies are not always great. Yes, they could be a lot better. You know, and, and some of the other countries have grown, have re reached political maturity faster than us. So the, the government has a more enabling out, um, outlook. The government is more accessible. Um, the biggest issue with Nigeria is the government is just simply not accessible. It's very difficult to speak to your leaders. It's very difficult to have one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations. It's very difficult to get your leaders to understand the basic problems that you have, and then they take them on. Um, well, in, so, when you're in Nigeria, you're able to engage much more than in other places, or is it easier? No, it's easier in other places. That's, in that's other a places. problem. It was, easy, it was easier for me to meet the president of Ghana, the president of South Africa, the president of Kenya, but I've never met the president of Nigeria. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's but you easier. get to travel with them to China. <laughs> but, no, but no, 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 you said something that I don't want us to lose, which is, I mean, I think that it's really important to talk about these things, especially in places in Nigeria, where a lot of times we are pessimistic about what's happening. But you said something about the energy and the population and how that really does mm. give us a, an edge, an edge yeah. and an advantage. What worries you about us misusing this edge? What worries you? Well, history has also taught us that having a large population, y large young population, growing population that's economically inactive is a huge risk. We saw that in the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And if, if we misuse and don't create an enabling environment um, to, to enable the young people to sort of grow, get educated, get into jobs, get employed, and be economically viable, then the risks are that mm. they will turn against you. And sometimes it's a one-way street. It's, it's hard to turn them back around again. So it's, I think it's important um, for, for leaders to remain humble, mm. and to understand that they're there to serve, and to understand that they're there to create opportunities for the younger citizens. Mm -hmm. um, many of us are already outside our economic cycle. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think the people that really matter, um, you know, without being too, too um, dictatorial, people that really matter are those kids between sort of 15 and 30. Um, because they're in the fundamental, uh -huh. the good part of their education that needs to be done properly and their economic activity. Um, after 30, um, you're sort of, you're influenced by what you've seen in the last 20 years mm -hmm. or the last 15 years. And before 15, you're probably too young to, to make a difference. Um, so it's very important to make sure that that sector grows up properly, gets educated properly, and, and does the right things. And you know, when the, the great Western nations and places like Japan, they grew when they had huge young populations, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they started declining when those populations started mm -hmm. aging. Um, same thing with the tiger economies of Asia. So it's Africa's turn. You know, and Africa has a very young population and a growing population. It's our turn now to turn that population into something. Mm. If we do what the Arabs did, 
then the Arab Spring that happened to them will happen could, here. Could quite easily it's not gonna you think so, thank you. Oh, all right, we wrap up this one. <laughs> Go ahead and have the last question. All right, so do you think we're positioned for the benefits of uh, bilateral agreements and all of that with several other countries? Take this China deal, for instance. We've always talked about a balance in trade. We're, we're not just taking from China. We should be giving China something in return. You think that was? talked about and considered um, as somebody in the private business you think we have something to offer China a lot we have commodities so China are here for a reason and they're, they're not here because they love Africa they're here because they love what we have um, and um, so we are in a position what we've got to make sure is that we don't have that issue that Kenya had in the 70s where they're selling the coffee at 80 cents and mm -hmm. it's coming back at eight dollars mm -hmm. um, so we need to make like, sure well we already do that with, the, we, we, with the, some of our commodities we, we anyway. do, absolutely. so now we so, have to make so we, sure we that, have to yes. make sure and uh, I think it's very important to to um to keep an eye on making sure that the bilateral agreements are not just one sided mm. and they're not just signed without implementing without being executed otherwise they're hallucinations <laughs> so i mean entrepreneurs out there people are watching you they want to also be a real estate mogul like you any advice for people watching today um, the advice our mothers gave us <laughs> <laughs> excellence integrity hard work and then no shortcuts I think I think um, everything you do needs to be right. The basis needs to be right. You've got to work hard for everything you have. Um, it's not. It doesn't come easy unless you're a politician. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> and and um, and excellence. Uh, the pursuit of excellence um, is extremely important. All right. Thank you so much for being here today. We look well, forward to having you back, talking about some of the tier two city expansions you'll be doing. Absolutely, my pleasure. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much for having me. You're watching the morning show. We're going on a short break right now. But when we come back, we'll be joined by Mustafa Chike, who will be former managing director of Asset Corporation, Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, to speak to us on the state of Nigeria's economy and about politics and the run-up to 2019. Yes. yes. We'll be right back.